This is Becoming Inclusive from the Kaleidoscope Group, where we're thinking differently about diversity, equity, and inclusion for more empowered people at work. We're committed to real change, and that begins with real conversations. Welcome in. Hey, everyone. This is your host, Kat Potts, and welcome back to Becoming Inclusive. Uh, today, I am joined by Master Facilitator and Senior Consultant, Mitch Brown. How are you doing, Mitch? Glad to have you back. Doing good. Hey, Kat. We are also joined by Miss Sue O'Halloran, also a Master Facilitator and Senior Consultant. How are you, Sue? Good, Kat. Hi, Mitch. Hi, Sue. <laughs> All right, let, let's rock and roll. I've been looking forward to this conversation. We're about a weekend now to Black History Month. So this has been pretty, you know, heavy on my mind and heavy on my heart. And I really kind of want to talk about sort of this month and how we've treated it leading up to 2022 and, and kind of this concept more. And you've said it best to you around victors and not victims when it comes to celebrating Black history as well as just the Black community. Yeah, I think we really take uh, advantage. I think the point we all know, we want this fully integrated. We just don't want a week. We don't just want a month. This is an everyday kind of thing that we need to be celebrating people's achievements. So we take this opportunity to look at Black achievements and movements that have really created real change in our lives. So I want to know the history and I want to know how it affects the present and into the future. Yeah, that's really awesome. Mitch, got any thoughts on that? Uh, I echo those thoughts. Uh, I think uh, part of what the charge is as well is to understand that there's a lot of legacy around, you know, uh, Black history. Uh, and it is uh, something that is also, you know, American history. Uh, so it's something that I think uh, in some ways, right, we don't appreciate in the same space. So much about what this is trying to do is to grow an appreciation uh, for that American story and also uh, do what we can in light of that story, uh, continue to drive equity and, uh, you know, the American ideals uh, through uh, our modern day uh, lives, right? And uh, uh, to me, you know, that's, that's what we're after. And let's face it, it can be a balancing act because you don't only want to tout achievements, but you don't only want to detail trauma, Right. Right. And so it's recognizing really hard truths and their relevancy to today. And then how do you empower people with that kind of pride, with that understanding of everyone's humanity? So it's not just sound bites, tokenism, but that it really empowers people to create the, the hopefully fair systems we're trying to create today. And I love that that point you brought up, Sue, around tokenism, right? Because it's like sometimes in a workplace environment, this month comes around and you feel like all eyes on me, right? And it's just kind of bizarre. It's like we're in 2022 and it's not that we want to like negate you know, that this is an important month and people really want to experience this or people's feelings towards it. We don't want it to go away, but it's also, um, it's a little bit much sometimes being in a workplace environment and feeling like, oh, now I have this month, you know, all eyes on me. What am I, what am I supposed to do with that? <laughs> right. I think we can, you know, just appreciate the pressure that can be on our employees of color when these special months come up until it is truly integrated. It's like celebrate on cue, you know, take advantage. The nation's paying attention despite your exhaustion, despite your anger. Just fast forward through that pain. So you because people are listening this month. So, I, again, I think taking the lead from your special interest groups um, in your company that they really take the lead, ask how can we support, what are we understanding, what might we be missing? It's complicated, even when we celebrate the first black anything, why does it have to be the first? Because people weren't let in. So you have to own that reality and what hasn't still changed at the same time we're celebrating progress, but it's kind of weird that we're making a cry for personhood. So if we can just understand the complexities involved as we celebrate, but we also validate people's day-to-day -day experiences. Right. And I think that kind of brings up to that idea around equity, Mitch, that you've, you've kind of been touching on. How do we use this opportunity to actually drive that, right? Well, you know, equity is an interesting thing uh, and topic uh, because when it comes to the work that we do, uh, equity is a big component. And what we're talking about here specifically is how this applies to race. 
And that is for sure connected to the historical um, uh, framing of, you know, uh, African-Americans, Black Americans in this country and in the corporate space. So equity is uh, when we talk about, you know, your prior question, you know, there may be some angst or I may feel the need to say, hey, uh, the month focused on me. Uh, you know, how do I move it from being performative uh, to being something that's substantive? Right. And I think organizations are uniquely situated to, uh, at least from an equity standpoint, to drive equity uh, with regards to where there has been uh, inequity based upon race and, you know, in the past. And one of the places I tell clients to go look all the time is, you know, look at your data, look at your trends, uh, look at, you know, promotions, look at hires, look at pay, right? Uh, there are certain things and you can go and see, We even within your own organization, and what I'll talk about here today is also, is you have to localize what this means for your own constituency, right? So there is a piece of Black history that we want to tell from a ceremonious or traditional standpoint or, you know, from a macro sense. All that is very important. And again, it's part of that legacy I spoke about earlier. But I think that, that every of, you know, body, every company, every organization has an opportunity to really try to understand, uh, you know, where inequity exists and what can they do to go about creating fairness and opportunities for everybody, uh, you know, based upon, again, this charge uh, uh, that we're really talking about, you know, today and right now and, and what that might mean. And that's why, Mitch, I think Black History Month can be such an opportunity because we all have these very truncated versions of history. You know, it's like uh, we overcame slavery. Martin Luther King brought civil rights. We have a black president. It's all better now. You know, obviously people know there's still a lot going on. But, you know, even when it's battled whether we should study Little Rock Nine, it's like the Little Rocks were continual. And the legal wins versus compliance or the fact that we've returned to segregation now in our schools and many of our neighborhoods without acknowledging past truths, it justifies and it reinforces the status quo. So if we are really going to view each other differently and create a stronger democracy and fairness and this equity and inclusion in our companies, we really have to understand that sociopolitical context. I, I really think companies have a chance here to give their employees the language and context to understand the world in which they are doing business, to, to reach customers, to uh, engage their employees. And again, it's never about blaming or shaming white people. Somebody, if I'm identified as white, I just think that instead of having that let's all get along kind of race talk, if we can really leverage, we're learning when we learn history, whether it's about environmental racism or food deserts or how redlining in our communities created the wealth gap, to just understand the world, different worlds we can be living in so we can reach across those divides to talk about the kind of companies and world that we do want to create. And achievements are a big part of that because I know I never learned about you know, black history when I was at school, but it's so much more that that in terms of understanding that there always was resistance and uh, celebration and joy. And it's like telling that that whole story, I think, can really change how we view one another and therefore treat one another. Yeah. And, you know, you bring up a great point, Sue, because, you know, even when I was in school learning about, you know, Black History Month, it was a lot of just kind of the heavy hitters, right? The people that everybody knew about. And that's not always so relatable for everyone. Or how can I feel like I can be a part of this movement, right? How can I be a part of this when you're, I'm trying to compare myself to some of, you know, these individuals like, MLK, Rosa Parks, that's what we're seeing. But it's like day to day, regardless of what level you're at, you can you can also contribute to that, right? You can contribute to making people around you, helping people around you better understand. And we have a real truncated version of the big hitters too. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Martin Luther King, um, you know, we don't often, like I, I, read, I was reading testimony about his despair before the poor people's march, you know, 
Or we take that one piece of I have a dream and people say, well, then we should be colorblind. He says a lot about being very intentional about recognizing race. He's not all about colorblindness in that negative sense. I know the positive sense of what people mean about paying attention to character. But he was saying we got to pay attention. He was considered a dangerous man. Rosa Parks was all of 42 in the civil rights movement. There's all these pictures of her. This elderly lady was so tired she had to sit yeah. down. This woman was involved in this movement. And there were many women who came before her on the buses. She was also very involved in fighting sexual abuse against women. So even with the heavy hitters, I think we've got it wrong. But one of the biggest things we get wrong about some of the people we celebrate is they came from communities. They came from whole movements. You know, the Montgomery bus boycott was happening when Rosa made her Stand. And I think we don't realize that we don't see what you say. We all have a part to play. Maybe you're not going to be the leader, but who is Martin Luther King without the movement? Who is Rosa Parks without the movement? And there's so many other people to celebrate of, of teachers and scientists, whatever, that we're not just accomplishing great things. And it's important to talk about their contributions, but they were part of bettering their whole communities and also the way they reached across other communities of color and other intersections with other diversity elements. I think that needs to be part of the story too. So we do see that everybody has a place in making change. Definitely, definitely. Mitch, I'd love to hear some thoughts on this from you. I think that, you know, it's. I think the bigger stories or I, I, I or remiss to, I don't, uh, the word that we use to characterize, but the stories that are more in that place of we've heard it uh, or legacy or a big traditional, I think it is a, you have to understand also that there are new generations coming behind me even, right? So, or you, right? To that story, maybe a new story, right? Uh, and I think that it is very important to have some continuity there. And I totally agree with Sue to say, hey, listen, there is so much, uh, you know, that goes unsaid or goes unnoticed uh, based upon who was supporting those individuals who stood them up. Right. And again, I think that is continually a part of what the ecosystem has to look like now. And to me, you know, again, I think I challenge uh, some of our listeners to not only think about this as individuals, but can think about your prior question. Right. Uh, you might want to think about what does this mean for organizations and entities. Right. Uh, we wait, want to think about what this means, obviously, from a standpoint of we live in a society where, you know, from a political standpoint, the government or, you know, everybody is, is can play a role, right, in the idea of driving us forward. Uh, we talk a lot about unity, right? And the idea of unity just means that to get to where we want to be, it's going to take us all. Uh, so I do agree with Sue when we say, hey, uh, in this in this portrayal of where we've been, right? It's an important story and narrative to, to tell, but to not get lost in this place of, well, uh, because of the, you know, players who were part of that narrative, right? That is some kind of way of a condemnation or a, a limiting factor or who we can be in our potential. Uh, it's so much there, right? And it's so important, again, uh, very comprehensive uh, that you think about what Black history means and what it can accomplish you know, going forward and in terms of who we are. Uh, so those are just a couple of thoughts based upon, uh, you know, what you just shared. But I do think, you know, that all of it is is definitely uh, important for sure. Definitely. And, and now I'm going to challenge you both for a second. So what do we do about the, the individuals out there who truly believe and say the African-American community, you get a whole month, you get a whole month. Would, that's not enough. You get a whole month. You know, I don't get a whole month. <laughs> so what's your, you know, what's your reactions to that? Well, depending well, upon who's saying it, it might be you get a whole year. I, I just <laughs> for my for my other folks who who are identified as white, just think if you were growing up in school and you had European Americans and Europeans one month to celebrate everything that they've ever done uh, back to the Roman empire, everything in that one month, you'd be like, what, how can you, well, that's true for any community. I mean, some of the new programming I'd like to see people do is even talking about before slavery on this continent, you know, what were Africans up to? Uh, you know, do you know about the Mali or Benin empires or the, uh, the black Roman empires um, and how imperialism changed the continent. I mean, there's just so much you couldn't even fit 
in a month or the whole African diaspora about how cultural ties are going across the world, black people in Asia and Australia, not just Africa or the West. I mean, how could you possibly fit it in a month, let alone right. thinking that that's too much? Definitely. Yeah, to me, to me that, uh, that question comes from a place, in my opinion, of bliss, uh, where it could be uh, woeful or just, you know, it could be uh, intentional, but it comes from a place of just not really recognizing that uh, there are different realities for others, right? And it begs the question, instead of why a month, uh, you know, to me, I would ask, you know, uh, what c caused the need for, you know, maybe the month to be created in the first place, right? And if you answer that question, you can really understand, right, uh, why a month. You might even challenge and say, hey, maybe a month is not enough, or maybe the idea uh, that we have to, you know, again, highlight, uh, you know, the contributions made by uh, Americans that, you know, uh, look like me, you know, we have to, you know, do something in the, in the face of what may have been before then, right, a very inequitable environment. Uh, so that's that's that answers the question to me, or that at least that that approach can tell that person that's why. And then I think a lot of times the second part implicit in what you ask is the sustainable element. Well, why do we still need it, right? And I think that in itself, going back to what we even talked about, you know, around even how we show up around Black History Month, uh, there's a, a element of you know resolution and resolving issues where. I think you focus on what we call weighted input. And simply put, uh, Kat, what I mean by that is, you know, you have to, uh, if you want to provide a solution to somebody, a lot of us are good natured people. Sometimes we do it in a unilateral way, right? You tell me I'm not welcome and I bring you some donuts. You say, Mitch, I hate donuts, right? But if I would have asked you, you know, what you see as welcoming or what that looks like to you, then the resolution I put forward would be more spot on. So I think before we can say, hey, there's no, no need for this anymore, or why do we still have this, or why do we have it in the first place? I think the answer lies with a lot of your you know, peers who, who are, are of African-American uh, identity, descent. Uh, you know, th that's where that re reality of the, of the, of the charge or, for the, 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 or the need for the, the month or the activities that come there of, of the month, right? That's where it really exists. And you know, I think, again, removing yourself out of bliss is saying two things. Uh, I want to be proximate and understand and seek to understand what that means, right? Uh, and I, I'm going to do something, uh, you know, in, in the interest of, of, of addressing uh, whatever that, you know, uh, that reality might be, right? So uh, to me, less about what I say to that person, but more about, you know, understanding, you know, what's behind the question and, and helping people really see that. I love that. I love that, Mitch, because really getting down to the core, right? How are we able to answer and help people get to a different level of understanding? And I'm also hearing you say it's that education piece, because yes, we've talked about education in this conversation, but in context of like you're in school and you're learning about the basics, there's so much more education. So you've hit on it too, that is so um, impactful, but it gets completely overlooked, which in some ways is impacting how people are digesting this month, right? Yeah, and again, because of racism is looked at as a few bad apples on a personal and interpersonal level, and let people under the systemic nature, the structural nature, it is very hard sometimes to say, well, that's in the past. If we don't understand how the past is showing up in the present, right in our workplaces, policies and practices that seem race neutral that are not. Um, it's hard for people to understand. But when you get the thread from history to the present and how it can create a different future, then we have a real chance of, first of all, crossing the divide with each other. And so, you know, employees need to feel seen and heard and understood. Everybody needs that. And part of that is to know my lived experience. And so I really hope that companies use this time to give people the language and the context to understand how people are living their lives so we can see how do we make it more inclusive. Because I, I just had this weekend, some to say, why are we doing the past? That's all in the past. We should just be getting on with it. We well, can't get on with it if you don't see what's happening right under your nose. And, and I think we, like I said, we've been miseducated about this. So while I wish we didn't have to have a month, I wish there was no need for it because all of our histories were so integrated. 
Um, I really like taking this time of going beyond heroes and holidays and really understanding the racialized nature of our society. I think that's going to make the future different. Definitely. Kat, really quickly, I think we'd be remiss if while we're having this particular conversation um, to, you know, not acknowledge that um, uh, the landscape, corporate landscape even, right, uh, of this conversation really changed two years ago with the murder of Mr. Floyd. Uh, And what we saw, at least in this space in our industry, was an uptick in the interest around how can we be more racially equitable, right? Or what can I learn about here in this space? And what I will commend, uh, you know, uh, you know, everyone on is I've seen some sustainable momentum in that in that uh, interest still to that to this day. But a new question kind of arose out of that to me uh, that, you know, and it was more in this place of what Sue just mentioned. Uh, Sometimes I think there could be such an indirect correlation for people between where we've been and where we're currently at. Right. And, and even if there is a more direct correlation or at least, you know, being able to dot the I's and, 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 and make that connection, sometimes we lose uh, the sense of culpability, which, again, has nothing to do with personal culpability. If that's the litmus test, right, then none of us, right, you, we, could do, we could just walk away and say, hey, we're all done with this because none of us particularly, you know, uh, in most cases, were around or, or had things to do with things that we talk about in a, in a past sense. But I want to challenge, right? You asked about what can organizations do and, and what can we do as individuals is to understand that like your opportunity to create fairness and opportunity and equity for others doesn't really just exist based upon the basis of you being culpable for, you know, the way things are. But it does say that I acknowledge, right? Uh, and, you know, again, I'm in tune with the different realities of others. And I take how I'm uniquely situated, right? as a charge to, in this situation, right, uh, back to your question, if I was a company and I lived in a community where, you know, when uh, Sue talked about that redlining, and I know that there's a significant, that's one of the variables that have contributed to a significant wealth gap and the racial divide in the community I operate and do business. Well, you know what? There may be an opportunity for you to think creatively outside the box. How do you upskill a community, right? where they may have been uh, disenfranchised out of education for generations? How do you uh, empower a community with financial literacy uh, when they may have been disenfranchised uh, at, from generation after generation of home ownership? Uh, those are some of the, you know, when we think about, well, what can we do? And, and the why do we need to do, right? Uh, those are just some of the things that I see uh, that people who are really taking the charge from a serious component, you know, really step out there and do. Yeah, so all the the special programming goes on in companies during this month are wonderful, of course. And again, I think we could expand it. We could talk more about liberation movements. We could talk more about resiliency and resistance and joy. There's, I, we could expand beyond achievements, which are important. But back it up with your actions inside. Who are you sponsoring? Who are you mentoring? How are you going outside your usual channels to attract people to your company? And then in your community, how are you supporting the school systems to be more excellent? Uh, COVID has so made the medical disparities based on race more apparent. How are you involved in public health initiatives, et cetera? You know, walking that talk, being a really good community member shows that you're not just like interested in including history. It's like, no, history is right now. We're making it. So what kind of history are you making? You know, four or five, 10 years from now, is your company going to be one that people talk about making real positive change? And that's something for all of us to think about what that legacy is going to be. Right. Mitch, Sue, I was about to ask you for two final golden nuggets, but you both just gave them to me already. This has been such an amazing conversation and I'd love to go on and on and on, but it's so deep and there's so many directions that we can take it. Um, But we are out of time. Is there any last words from either of you? You, Again, you just gave me two amazing (laughs) golden nuggets. Um, But before before we got to wrap it up, I just want to know, is there anything else? Anything, any final? I, I would say, I would say localize and modernize uh, what this moment means, right? Uh, I think, uh, you know, again, there is examples of Black history happening every day. 
uh, their examples to stand up around, uh, you know, uh, empowering individuals and very, very influential individuals that are, again, day in and day out. Uh, if we think about the ideals uh, in, that are exemplary, right, that we, that we espouse from a lot of these examples that we looked to in the past, find out who's doing that in your organization, right? Uh, find out who's doing that right now under the guise of something maybe new, right? In technology, uh, in, you know, you know, we talk about the metaverse and virtual and VR, right? There are opportunities, I guess, what I'm trying to share with folks around what we can do going forward. Again, my philosophy is that, you know, going forward together in a unified way that we can accomplish anything that we desire to. And that's the beautiful thing about tomorrow, isn't it? Uh, that you can always, you know, show up a lot better. My last word would just be listen. You know, educate yourself. Take the responsibility. Educate yourself. Read, read, watch films. We're so lucky. You can you can learn anything these days, and just listen to each other. Take the lead from your employees of color. Listen. Yes. Oh, thank you both so much. You know, we are better together, right? That's the under, underlying message here is we are we are better together and unity is, is the answer. So again, thank you, Mitch. Thank you, Sue. It's been a pleasure. Looking forward to having you both back on. Again, this is Kat Potts, your host, and this is Becoming Inclusive. Thanks for joining us and a special thanks to our subscribers. Consider becoming one today. Becoming Inclusive is presented by the Kaleidoscope Group, your full-service diversity, equity, and inclusion partner serving clients worldwide. Learn more and continue the conversation at kgdiversity.com.